During the years of war, Norwich suffered grievous damage from bombing. Not only were 330 people killed and another 1,200 injured, but a couple of thousand houses were destroyed, to say nothing of the 30,000 homes which were damaged, some of them severely. This isn't an actual raid on the city, but an exercise held late in 1939, when war had broken out, but hadn't yet had a real effect on people at home. Members of the Air Raid Precaution Services and the Auxiliary Fire Service were preparing for what was to come, learning how to deal with incendiary bombs dropped by raiders. This film was made for training purposes by George Swain, Jr., a photographer who had a shop in St Giles. The City Council made available a number of derelict houses, this was the era of slum clearance, and these were set alight so the AFS, with their primitive equipment, could get to work on a real fire. Later in the war, they had to do so in real earnest when the city centre was set ablaze by thousands of incendiary bombs. The firemen were given uniforms and rubber boots, ladders and trailer pumps, but they had to find their own vehicles. All kinds of cars, vans and lorries were pressed into service. Not all the city's big fires were caused by enemy action. This was the scene in the back of the inn's area after a fire on the night of October the 3rd, 1940. It said the fire started in the Busman's Social Club in White Lion Street. It spread quickly through the tight-packed buildings and devastated the whole of the corner of White Lion Street and the back of the inns. Less extensive was the fire that damaged a thatched house at Thorpe, though its impact on the people living there must have been no less. Norwich buildings and streets were left in tatters after the war, and it took many years to clear up and remove the scars. Some of the people whose homes were reduced to a pile of rubble were lucky if they managed to get one of the new factory-made prefabricated homes that were going up around the city. About 350 prefabs were erected around Norwich, the first one going up in 1946. They were designed for a ten-year life. These prefabricated buildings arrived on site by lorry and the segments were put together on the already prepared concrete base. Here comes the bathroom. That's part of the dining room and kitchen. And there's the chimney going on. For many people, these prefabs were luxury homes and well after the war, when the buildings had reached the end of their life, the authorities found it difficult to get people out. And now from the cameras of filmmakers Charles Scott and Geoffrey Campling, scenes and events around the city filmed between 1947 and 1950.
After six years of peace, or austerity as we called it at the time, it was felt Britain needed cheering up. We all needed a chance to let our hair down and enjoy ourselves. And enjoy ourselves we did at the Festival of Britain. In the carnival atmosphere, we felt that we were getting over those years of rationing, of air raids and hardship. The spirit of those wartime years was superb, but now there was a new spirit abroad. Norwich was one of the 13 centres in the country staging a week-long festival in June 1951. The week began with a civic service at the cathedral, and the next day Princess Elizabeth visited the city. Thousands of people gathered in the marketplace to get a glimpse of her, making a speech from the balcony of the city hall. Down Riverside Road, near Foundry Bridge, there was a gathering of small ships of the Royal Navy, and 41 gleaming entrants from European boat builders in the 1951 Pavillon d'Or, as part of the visit of the international crews to England. One boat came from Stockholm, over 850 miles away. Also, there was the Wherry Albion from the Broads, two years into her new life as a restored craft of the Norfolk Wherry Trust, whose object was to save one of these working craft. But it was soon back to work after the festival. This is Lawrence Scott and Electromotors, a firm specialising in electric motors and winches for ships. They had two sites, one in Thorpe Road, now gone, and the other beside the London to Norwich railway line. These are some of the apprentices working there in the early 1950s. Some trades involve the use of machines, such as lathes, for cutting and shaping the parts of an electric motor. The craftsmen who operate these we call turners. Alan from the Avenue Road School, Norwich, is one who is learning to use a lathe. In every trade, the firm relies upon its older craftsmen with many years of experience for the most important jobs. And it is from these that the young apprentice learns his job like Michael from the Loddon County Primary School. William, who was educated at the Gurney Henderson School in Norwich, as well as Michael from St Michael's School at Inglethorpe, which is near King's Lynn, and Keith from the Lowestoft School and the Lowestoft Technical College, are three apprentices who made such progress that they were soon able to tackle small machines entirely on their own. Perhaps some of the lads helped build this replica of the Royal Yacht Britannia. Seen coming out of the Thorpe Road entrance, it was put together in 1953 as a float for the coronation procession. Curl's store in Orford Place was a victim of one of the heaviest air raids of the war in April 1942. After the site had been cleared of wreckage, the area that had once been the basement of the store was flooded to serve as a huge static water tank holding thousands of gallons with which to fight fires caused by incendiary bombs. It took more than ten years for rebuilding to start and for a new store to rise on the site of the old. Curls is now Debenhams, but other old established firms in the same block have managed to retain their identity. One is R.G. Pilches, which moved back to Briggs Street from wartime exile in Surrey Street when the building was completed in 1956. Yes, there were still policemen on point duty in Norwich at this time, but how they dealt with this form of traffic, we don't know. 
The circus was a regular visitor to Norwich in the 1950s, and the equipment and animals came by train and made their way through the city to Eden Park. There was a Cold War, of course, and a hot war, but that was far away in a place called Korea. It came very close to home, though, when the casualty lists came through. And then came the great day when Norwich welcomed the Royal Norfolks back from Korea, and these veterans of another war marched past the city hall to the strains of rural Britannia. Norwich was developing fast during the 1950s, and the city was proud of its efforts. The city council commissioned a film to show people what was being achieved. Our guide is Bernard Storey, the town clerk. Making a start not with houses, but with a school. These machines, and a great mass of equipment besides, all began what you'll see in a few minutes, the biggest of our new schools. But babies first, or we won't need schools, Infant welfare clinics are now taken for granted, yet a past generation had nothing like these. And quite soon, their babies no longer. They're at school. Yes, they're happy here with modeling and blackboards. Lucky young people to be able to go to a school like this, a new one at North Earlham. Next door is the new North Earlham Junior School. What a contrast all this is with the cramped places where an earlier generation had somehow to learn the three R's. Plenty of room for play. Norwich City College, Ipswich Road, and caters for students in a wide range of subjects, from engineering to languages or domestic science. In the engineering shops, this young man shapes a milling cutter. This carpentry and joinery class is another token of the many activities going on in this modern building, a new landmark in Norwich. The city's well-stocked central library, and modern branch libraries such as this. Norwich has a fine record of library service. A footnote to education in its earlier stages, and an important one, the road crossing patrol. No doubt about how well drilled in safe crossing these children are. Here's a still more treacherous crossing, and for this there is a policewoman on duty to make sure all goes well and that traffic is controlled. Parents are thankful for these precautions. Yes, in Norwich we know our police are wonderful, as are our policemen. The City Council hasn't run away from civil defence and its grim implications. Here is a typical exercise carried out in their own spare time by some of this small band of volunteers. They don't like the overshadowing need behind this practice any more than the general public do but they are determined to be ready. You are seeing the rescue of a supposed casualty from the upper story of a bomb-wrecked house. How carefully and skillfully the volunteer casualty is lowered. Though Norwich Fire Brigade gave up horses over 35 years ago, there is still drama and glamour in a smart turnout from the spacious fire station in Bethel Street which is of a size to be expected in a city of the importance of Norwich. In addition to covering the whole city, the brigade is responsible for a considerable area of Norfolk. Next door to the fire station, these domestic gas meters have been brought to the city Weights and Measures Office for testing. Most of the inspections by the Weights and Measures Department, however, are performed away from the office. Cleanliness is strictly observed as, for instance, in this check of loaves being delivered at the door. A very important aspect of the work, in view of present-day prices, is the testing of petrol pumps. 
These are all made according to patterns approved by the Board of Trade. The modern petrol pump is a precision job. This small sample is measured and found correct. Milk bottles are made to a British standard specification. Besides, checks in the street from the roundsman's barrow, visits are made to dairies. The school children's one third of a pint is also checked. This is the day of the pre-packed article. Inspectors visit factories, checking machines and their output. This automatic scale is weighing flour. The pan fills at the correct weight, tips and away goes the flour down the chute to the paper bag below. The machine's almost human. To settle the flour down, the bags pass over a vibrator. And then mechanical arms fold the tops over and seal them, the flour not being touched by hand at any stage of the packing. As a final example of the range of the Weights and Measures Department's work, we take you to the electricity generating station. And here we find weighing machines incorporated in the overhead track, along which the Telfer cars bring in the coal to the boilers. Shiploads of coal are checked over these scales to an accuracy of one half of one percent, or better. Now we're well off the usual sightseeing round to the realm of street works, repairs and maintenance. The city is responsible for all these and a great deal more, besides the important job of direct labour house building. No wonder there's a great array of workshops and stores to be kept handy at various points in the city. You should remember that there are 175 miles of streets in Norwich for which the corporation is responsible. And there's sand, lots of it. It's piled up, ready for the cold winter mornings, when before daylight, men have begun the task of spreading this sand on slippery and dangerous roads. Often, just as the road is nicely sanded, down comes the snow. This is a machine which burns off the road surface, ready for a new coat. One of the necessary tasks on the roads is this kind of thing, the construction of a roundabout at a dangerous crossroads. This particular job took several weeks because the roundabout is a big one, but it was abundantly worthwhile. Lives are saved and personal injury avoided. Now that this roundabout is fully established. Norwich would be in a bad way without this service that finishes its round of calls by dumping its loads here, the refuse tip at Harford, at the city's edge. It's efficiently done at the tip, thanks to experience and modern machines such as those now in action. The bulldozer plays a big part in the proceedings. Decidedly, this machine earns its keep. And so, on to baths for swimming. The Parks Committee deals with this one at Lakenham, which in the summer is not merely busy, but crowded when school ends. This bath was rebuilt a few years after the war, and there are plans for increasing the city's swimming facilities. Yes, Norwich in the 50s was indeed a fine city, but it kept many of its old buildings, and some of them were showing their age. They looked tumble-down, unkempt and dowdy. Then, in 1958, the Civic Trust showed just what could be done to improve a drab, run-down shopping street by getting together with the traders of Magdalen Street in a pioneering facelift scheme. Architects Misha Black and Kenneth Bays masterminded a thorough rehabilitation of the entire street. Shop fronts were tidied up, with new lettering more in keeping with the buildings they adorned. Walls were repainted in colours chosen to blend together, not clash, as had so often happened in the past, and even the street signs were tidied up. The work cost each shopkeeper about £80. When the scheme was complete and the refurbished street reopened in 1959, it was described as an eye-opener. The Magdalene Street scheme set the pattern for many other street refurbishment schemes up and down the country. It spread to the country towns of Norfolk, 
to Holt and Aylsham and down the market, as well as throughout Britain. Norwich had suffered severely during the war from bombing, great damage being done particularly by the so-called Baedeker raids of April 1942. When peace came, many plans were made for rebuilding and for a new city centre which could cope with vastly increased traffic. In the 60s, the whole of the east side of narrow St Stephen's was demolished to make room for a new dual carriageway road leading from a new roundabout at St Stephen's gates into the very heart of the city. Elsewhere, many familiar buildings and landmarks disappeared with the building of an inner ring road, designed, unlike the new St Stephen's, to keep traffic out of the city centre. The bright new face of Magdalen Street was spoilt when the Stump Cross area was cleared to make way for a flyover which swept across the end of the street. More fine historic buildings disappeared to be replaced by a new style shopping centre named Anglia Square. Norwich is the capital of East Anglia, a farming province, and for centuries the cattle market occupied a site right in the middle of the city, overlooked by the castle of the Shire Hall. With its acres of pens for cattle and pigs and other animals, it was the largest weekly market for cattle in Britain, and the sixth largest one for pigs. Cattle sometimes found their way into the oddest places, when being driven on the hoof to or from the market. But there was really no place for cattle and pigs, sheep and poultry in the middle of a thriving city in post-war Britain. The end came in 1960, when the old pens and the covered pig market were dismantled, following the removal of the market to Harford Bridges. Would anything be quite the same again? For many a year, the Easter and Christmas fairs had ousted the cattle in their season, and they continued to occupy the site right up to 1987. Until the 50s, Norwich had a dozen cinemas. By 1961, when this film was made, several of them had closed their doors, like the Mayfair in Magdalen Street, the Regal in Deerham Road, and the Theatre de Lux, as it was spelled, or the Theatre de Lou, as we called it, and the Hippodrome in St Giles that had been built as an opera house. The old Odeon in Bottle Street was still going, and the Theatre Royal was showing films too. On All Saints Green there was the Gaumont, originally the Carlton, and down Prince of Wales Road there were two cinemas, the ABC, previously the Regent, and the Norvik, opened in 1912 as the Electric Theatre. Nineteen sixty one was the last year of operation of the Norvik, which had the distinction of being the first cinema in Norwich to show cinema scope films. Over on an old golf course at Erlen, R. G. Carter's men were busy putting up Dennis Lasden's buildings for the University of East Anglia. The idea for a university in Norwich went back to the last century, 
But it wasn't until anticipation of the post-war population bulge brought an expansion of higher education in the late 1950s, and after some two years of dedicated hard work by a group of distinguished local people, that the go-ahead was given by the University Grants Committee in April 1960. July the 11th, 1977. An Andover of the Queen's flight touches down at Norwich Airport, bringing the Queen to Norwich in her jubilee year. Traditionally, the Queen touches the hilt of the civic sword and then walks towards the civic party. One of her visits that day was to the Hewitt School in Norwich, where official guests are presented. Then she watched schoolchildren from all over Norfolk in a finely rehearsed display of dance, improvisation and movement. Later, the Queen visited County Hall, where she met representatives of local voluntary associations. The Queen then chatted to two 90-year-old twins, Rosetta and Alice, who then signed the visitor's book and received a gift from the county. One of the principal industries of Norwich was the shoe trade, for which the city was known far and wide. The small army of people worked in a labyrinth of corridors and rooms in Colgate. It was not long after these pictures were taken in 1981 that the factory closed.
Norwich has seen many changes over the years, and there are more to come. The Castle Mall project, the brainchild of architect Lambert Scott and Innes, will change the very character of an ancient part of Norwich, the area around the cattle market and Timber Hill. But whatever changes take place, Norwich still retains its individuality. It's still a pleasant place to live and work. People come from all over the world to savour the atmosphere of one of Britain's most ancient and still flourishing cities. <laughs> 